The box on the top left is awareness. Now, we're talking about are people aware, the man in the street, are they aware that there's IT and other failures affecting them? And the answer must be yes. It's not so much in the news at the moment, but certainly last year it was always in the news. There was no endless bits of front page papers about breaches and baggage not going through Terminal 5 because somebody had unplugged the computer or, or visa transactions not working and people having to wash all the dishes at the restaurant and all this stuff. Everyone knows about that. And we're getting to see more news about some of these claims that consumers might be signing up to. So I'm pretty confident this is a useful trend. I also have, uh, which I'm happy to let you have, uh, the latest survey from the Polymer Institute, and that's going to come out in a couple of weeks, uh, where we go into some of a, a survey of GDPR progress in some numerical detail, and I'm happy to send uh, that to you as well if, that, if numbers interest you. So awareness, I think we're getting, going to get progress and we're going to get more of, particularly once the, the, the news isn't, isn't uh, clogged up with Brexit. Now, the funny thing about the GDPR and the prior legislation is it always reminds us that we must do fair and lawful processing. So it's not just the GDPR that we need to keep an eye on when making sure that we're staying in compliance. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that we could be doing wrongly or our colleagues could be doing wrongly. And I think that although the ICO is extremely good, as are the other regulators, in the laws that they're competent for, I think they're perhaps not so good in some of these other areas. And some of them are just tremendous, if you like nerdy laws. I mean, they're great. I mean, my favorite probably of this lot uh, at the moment is the Payment Services Directive with its two-hour response notification time. You've got a, your data breach response in two hours. How crazy is that? I can't sober up in two hours. Never mind. <laughs> Give a response. Hot on its heels, um, this uh, new regulation on non-personal data. Who would have thought of such a thing? We haven't had a session on it, I don't think, uh, uh, this weekend, but I'm sure we will in a future, uh, future conference. So it's not that test threshold of is it personal data, that isn't your sole concern. You need to keep an eye on non-personal data, and already in the last few days, a French minister expressed that they had an interest in extending the GDPR to non-personal data. So that's my, my second stick uh, for creating my story. As we're talking about personal data, I just wanted to remind you of a very small thing in the definition that changed from the law that we enjoyed before. And it's that bit in the middle. As we all know, it now refers to online identifiers. And we know that, of course, because we know that cookies are now definitely personal data. Remember, under the old law, they weren't personal data unless they were correlated with other information you might have from the user going onto the website because the user had logged in or bought something. Then you could correlate their session, and then it was personal data. Not so now. We are all comfortable that cookies are personal data from the get-go. And therefore, so are MAC addresses, the number, that secretive number that your network cards produce when accessed over the network. And so too might be your public keys that are used for your entry onto the blockchain. I forever see blockchain solutions where they talk about, oh, don't worry about GDPR, we've got our blockchain here, and, but we keep all our data, the payload, in this database over here. And we link from our blockchain to this database. But what's doing the linking? It's an online identifier, arguably. So do be careful about some of these claims about being perfectly uh, GDPR friendly. You have to just test them a bit and understand how that thing works. And it's relevant because you will find that there's many more systems in the business that get caught up by our beloved GDPR than you might have thought. So that's why that on-identifier thing is a really important part of the story. Now, cybersecurity. I think 
There's three things in the GDPR that you need to know about cybersecurity, headline points. And I always hear about things number two and things number three. Number two, disasters, a breach, we better notify the authority on that form in 72 hours, just scratch out something, send it in, it'll disappear, You'll never hear from it again. Hopefully, fingers crossed. And number three, if it's sufficiently serious, we better tell the users and irritate the board and make sure we've still got a job the following week. So those are the two things that we always hear. What about number one? What about that obligation of security in Article 32? So often, you see in contracts or on things people write down, when they talk about security, they bring up the definition of personal data breach. Look here, I've got it, uh, uh, I've got it here for you. But that definition is only used in respect of notifications. If you read the preceding clause, the obligation to have security is this. And it goes on at some length to say that, your, that security includes availability. So I would say that if your system goes down, it stops working, doesn't matter why, and people no longer have access to their personal data, that is a breach of Article 32 and a breach of the GDPR. Not a notifiable breach, but still a breach. If you have ransomware come and attack you and you can't go to work happily, then uh, no data will be exfiltrated in that exploit. So no personal data breach, but breach of Article 32 and breach of the GDPR. And I don't think people are expecting that. And I think when we see these stories in the press about banking system goes down, you can't get online, that visa one I mentioned can't process the cards, these are all breaches of the GDPR. No question. What does that mean in practice? It means that if you have suppliers providing that technology, you need to do that old-fashioned thing and look at the service level agreements and the contractual language with that provider to make sure they give you the standard that you want. You want to make sure that if the system does go down and you are in breach of the GDPR, which you will be, that your redress, the indemnities or other protection, you get from that supplier. And it's not just limited to 50p in a bag of the crisps. It's very important. Now, for those of you that enjoyed um, the old law, happy times, I remember it well. <laughs> then the game that we played for many years, just to, I can be honest about it now, we, we don't have it really, is that we try to shoehorn everybody into being a processor. That was the game. And the reason we shoehorn everyone into being a processor is because although the word processor was mentioned in the law, it had no responsibilities under the law. The law just said, controllers shall uh, choose processors who are sober, sensible, and look like they can do a good job. And then the processor does a good job. But if they fail, the penalty on the processor was merely the breach of contract with you as the controller. That's all it said. The, con the processor was not breaching the law. Not so now. And this is probably the most significant shift, I would say, in the detail of the GDPR. Every processor is responsible under the GDPR. And um, oddly enough, in the detail, I would say you can actually find that depending on what the processor, your controller does, you can bring your offshore processor into the scope of the GDPR. It's another technical discussion for another day. But processors are directly responsible. So much so, they're now deciding whether they want to rather be controllers rather than processors. But just keep an eye, remember, directly responsible. It's an important building block for my little diagram at the end. Now the crazy bits. Uh, everyone's got a favorite uh, section of the GDPR. This is the bit I keep under my pillow. 82 is just, just crazy. And so all that innocent tool proven guilty, that, of course, is not true in the GDPR, is it? It's the reverse. You're guilty until you can prove you're innocent. There is a reversal of the burden of proof. 
in the GDPR. If you don't believe me, look it up. We've got the book. I think it's quite difficult if you've been hacked to show that you're innocent. The evidence, like a puppy and the poo, is just there. <laughs> Your defense will not go well. So remember, there's a reversal of the burden of proof.